Um, so I'm going to be talking about the, uh, an idea. Uh, the title of the talk is the quantum biology loophole. And this is a new area of research that I'm really excited to dig into that I've been working on over the summer. Um, and yeah, I'm excited to hear feedback from, from this community. So um, quantum biology is this emerging interdisciplinary field uh, that sits at the intersection of physics, chemistry, biology, and complex systems. And um, why do we need to find a loophole? <laughs> Like why, why, does, why do we need to find a loophole where quantum information and biology can intersect? Well, the reason is that conventional wisdom, um, since the dawn of quantum mechanics 90 years ago, has always held that quantum information simply cannot survive in a biological system because it's too hot, it's too messy, uh, it's wet, and any you know, fragile quantum information would very quickly decohere in that space. Um, biological systems operate on very different time scales as well than typical, our, our typical thinking, our typical intuitions about quantum systems. So over the last 30 or so years, starting in around 1978, there is some key, uh, key work that was done in 1989 as well, and we'll kind of go through this, um, experimental results have started to tell a little bit of a different story about quantum effects mattering in biology uh, as well as biochemistry. And so there's a variety of different quantum effects that have started to emerge as important in biological systems. Um, so uh, quantum coherence in photosynthesis, the work of Graham Fleming that started at Cal Berkeley in 2007, started to jumpstart this new exciting area of research where more and more evidence has been starting to collect around the idea that the efficiency of photosynthesis actually may rely on quantum coherence. Um, in 1989, Judith Klinman, also at Cal Berkeley, worked on and was able to experimentally validate the idea that uh, protons in enzyme reactions um, are actually tunneling through material. So they're able to move more rapidly through space, through, through a, um, through in a cellular environment than you could otherwise explain in classical mechanics. And so quantum tunneling is the uh, leading sort of theory and it's very well, very experimentally validated at this point. Um, and then radical pairs, um, this was first proposed by Klaus Scholten in 1978. Uh, the idea that radical pairs um, may be involved in the magnetic compass sensing mechanisms of birds. There is some research that's been done in other animals as well. Uh, birds just happen to be the animal where it's been the most studied. So these quantum effects are showing up um, in some of the most fundamental biological processes. You know, photosynthesis, for example, you know, we is fundamental to all of the life on the surface of, of the planet Earth. Um, but what I'm most interested in is what about in us? What about in human beings? Um, if we're starting to see quantum effects showing up in more and more places in biology, is it possible that they could, they could also matter uh, for the way that human cognition work, works? Um, so this question, are we quantum computers, are we able to process quantum information, uh, was posed by Matthew Fisher, who's a physicist at UCSB um, and is a, a collaborator of, um, and this is sort of the sort of high level question that he's been developing a theory around for the last six years. And in this event today, um, Allison and Anthony and Metaculus have asked us all to sort of create a question for prediction. So my question is, um, and I tried to make this specific, we may be rewording it a little bit uh, to, to make it easy to sort of validate a yes or no answer in 12 months time. Um, but the question is really, you know, can we validate this, this the theory that um, quantum information processing may be happening in the brain? And what I'm gonna try to do in the next 10 to 15 minutes is uh, hopefully to give you enough information to feel like you at least have the foundational knowledge to start to make a prediction on this question. 
Um, so this is just a little bit of a plan. We'll talk about the, the hypothesis that's been developed around the quantum brain. Um, we'll dive into what that looks like in terms of nuclear spins and why they, why they matter. Um, and we'll talk about lithium isotopes as an experimental probe into these mechanisms. Uh, and then I'll just mention a little bit of the active research, which um, if you want to know more about that, I definitely recommend coming to the session tomorrow where we'll have a lot more time. And Dan um, Gershevich is going to help um, facilitate that with me. Um, and then we'll get back to predicting. So before we dive in specifically to the quantum brain theory itself, I just want to say a couple of words about quantum information processing. Um, so if, you know, probably needless to say for this audience, but just to reiterate it, quantum mechanics has been one of, if not the most successful scientific theory ever developed. And in the sense that it has absolutely superb experimental validation, it is very successful at predicting um, natural phenomena. And quantum information simply cannot be embodied in sort of the um, local objective uh, states that we are intuitively used to living in in and sort of are at human scale. Um, and so why do we care about utilizing quantum information processing um, if, if we can be um, clever enough to tap into its mechanisms? Well, this is just a, a sort of a little bit of context setting from a researcher in um, quantum information at, at Oxford, uh, Peter Leak, and he says that quantum information, uh, quantum computing, quantum information processing fundamentally is the best way that we know of to um, process information based on the laws of physics as we know them today. And so that is why it matters. That is why we care about it. So um, this uh, story really starts with a surprising finding um, that uh, was um, identified and or, or revealed by uh, some work that Matthew Fisher uh, led um, in a multidisciplinary group of scientists around the effects of lithium isotopes on animal behavior. And what they found is that um, a single neutron, the difference between the difference between lithium six and lithium seven, which are the two stable isotopes of lithium, ended up having a very dramatic impact on animal behavior. And if you are a biologist or if you are a chemist, that is not um, that does not align with your um, standard expectations of what what would happen because the the isotopic difference um, shouldn't matter from a chemical perspective. It's the same chemical and it should have the exact same reactions. So this was a very surprising finding. And why did Matthew start to go down the path of, of investigating this area? Well, it was because he had come across this original research paper from 1986 uh, that looked at lithium isotopes. And um, this was done actually by a psychiatrist, not a uh, physicist. It was not, it was not a person who was thinking about the sort of um, it, the information in the nucleus of the lithium atoms. It was somebody who was just testing different knobs around uh, trying to understand how psychiatric drugs work. And the research, um, a researcher fed uh, different kinds of uh, isotopic mixes of lithium to um, pregnant rats and looked at the impact on their behavior. And so the um, the item circled in green is pharmacy lithium, so that is uh, just what you get when you dig lithium out of the ground. The naturally occurring isotopic mix is 92% lithium-7 and only 8% lithium-6, and so the, it's really the, the, you get the same impact between pharmacy lithium and lithium-7. And when uh, the rats were you know, observed, they found nest building to be absent, grooming of self to be very infrequent, retrieval of pups to be very infrequent, state of alertness to be low. They were very um, low energy rats. <laughs> and in stark contrast, the rats that were given lithium-6, the rare isotope of lithium, had instead a very excessive nest building, excessive uh, grooming, excessive retrieval of the pups. The pups were very clean. They were hanging out with the mom the whole time. Uh, and the state of alertness was very high. So it, this is a pretty extraordinary finding. You know, I think we, we all just about fell out of our chairs. 
we saw that. Um, and so this got Matthew thinking, you know, the way that a, a, I think only a physicist really would, um, which is how, you know, what, how, why does the, the single neutron make a difference? Um, is there something, you know, a, a neutron is a quantum mechanical um, uh, particle. It's a subatomic particle. So is, could there be something at the um, nuclear level that is actually making a difference? And um, so he started looking at the decoherence time of lithium-6 versus lithium-7. Of course, nuclear spins are very isolated uh, from being measured by the, by the environment. Uh, the um, atom on, the, on your left is uh, table salt, and it has a decoherence time of about a tenth of a second. Uh, lithium-7 has a decoherence time of about 10 seconds. And um, li lithium-6 actually has a much, much longer decoherence time of about five minutes. So very, very isolated from being, uh, from being measured by the environment. So quantum information that is stored in that um, atomic nucleus, uh, that information has a, you know, uh, has a lifespan that actually lasts much, much longer. And so there's this huge isotopic difference between lithium-6 and lithium-7. So that started to be a clue. And so he said, okay, how can I, like, how, how can I actually investigate this? I, I'm starting to get this idea that nuclear spins may actually matter. Um, how can I actually investigate it? And so he started to take an approach of reverse engineering. If I were to des develop a theory of quantum information processing mattering in the brain and actually having an impact on the behavior of these rats, what would need to be true? Uh, and so he started to create a list of requirements. And I'm gonna return to this um, a little bit later in the talk, but this is just a high level overview to say that, you know, he, he started to um, say, okay, in order for quantum computation to actually work, in order for quantum information processing to be present, uh, there needs to be certain characteristics of the, the, nuclear, of the nucleus of the atom. The, a certain type of atom needs to be present. It needs to be isolated enough from the environment that, uh, that information processing can actually happen. It needs to have a mechanism of entanglement. Um, and importantly, it also needs to have a mechanism of transduction from the quantum, uh, the small scale of quantum information to um, connecting the dots to the biological scale. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna move through this very quickly. So there is a proposed um, molecule called the Posner molecule uh, that actually meets the criteria um, for sort of the ideal um, environment for, to, to house uh, protected quantum information in, in a biological system. And there's a lot of interesting um, findings about this molecule, but I think we'll, we're gonna move through this really quickly. Uh, uh, and how does this connect to lithium? I just wanna show that um, simulations show that it is energetically favorable for the central calcium atom in this molecule to be replaced by two lithium atoms. And so there's a connection between this atom and lithium uh, working in these rats. Um, there's a lovely theory around the mechanism of entanglement, which we won't get too deep into. I'll probably just skip ahead. <laughs> Ant-Man agrees that entanglement between Posner molecules in the brain is probably the way that, we're, that this thing, these things actually work. Um, so I just leave you with the question of, of what do you predict? Do you think that this mechanism of quantum information processing will be experimentally validated? Thank you. Okay, no, no, so let's stay. Let's take Washington. one quick question. One, very quick, very quick. All right, so um, in organic chemistry, uh, there's obviously a concept called the isotope effect, whereby atoms... Um, behave differently because of the ch changed length of covalent bonds. And this has actually been exploited medically recently. It's now got to clinical trials actually led. Only one. Only one. Right, right. So I want to know whether um, there's anything, whether the possibility of something similar to that, that's purely based on the mass of the atom rather than anything quantum, has been excluded or explored at all. That, that, that was my question, actually, so. Good, good. 
Question. Oh, can you hear me? Hi. Great question. I'm Dan. Hi. Um, the lithium effect led Matthew Fisher to conjecture a coupling between nuclear spin states and allowed uh, chemical reactions due to a constraint between rotation of a molecule and the spin states. And an entangled set of spin states could modulate biochemistry. Whether the lithium effect is true is somewhat independent of whether that conjecture is true. And I'm personally much more interested in the, in the latter. Um, so I agree, it's very possible we'll discover that the lithium effect is due to diffusional differences or some other kinetic isotope effect. If this topic interests you, there's a whole session about it tomorrow. So do check in on that.